Good morning, and, Good morning. Wel and welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to have you with us this morning as we worship together. Let's stand and join together in our responsive call to worship. One moment, please. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that his ways may be known on earth, his salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May, May all the, the peoples, peoples praise, praise you. you.
People of God, brothers and sisters, Psalm 68 commands us to sing to God, to sing in praise of his name and extol him who rides on the clouds. Praise is not just a sound we make. Praise is not just a set of words we speak. Praise is not merely the thoughts we possess. Praise, true praise, ought to be a response of our entire bodies. Yes, with our lips we should praise him, but also with our hands and with our feet. Our eyes ought to praise him and our ears as well. Let everything that is within us praise the Lord.
Well, good morning again. It is so good to be together for worship with you all this morning. And uh, we want to just take a couple of quick moments to remind you of some things that are happening in the life of the church, especially today. So immediately following this worship service this morning, there will be a, a quick, a specially called meeting of this congregation where we will ask you all uh, to decide on the nomination of Joyce Daniels to serve on our administrative council. Uh, so we're glad that we have folks here who can help us make that decision. Uh, of course, uh, you would be required to be a member of the congregation in order to vote, uh, but you are certainly more than welcome to stay for that quick meeting after this service. Um, secondly, after that quick meeting, we have a very special time of celebration planned downstairs. Hopefully you saw some of the good things awaiting us. Uh, we have a very special thank you reception coffee hour uh, in honor of Bob Letts, um, who has faithfully served our uh, administrative council for uh, two terms, as well as serving one full term as president. And so we are so thankful for his service and we wanna give thanks to God for him today. So please join us downstairs after this for a very special uh, coffee hour. I think we've been calling it almost lunch. Um, so that'll be great. Uh, last evening, we had an awesome, awesome fellowship event, our spaghetti dinner. Wasn't it a great time for those who were here? Yeah. It was really awesome. And so I do need to just take a couple of uh, seconds to thank some folks this morning. Uh, of course, to thank uh, Joyce uh, Daniels and Jeannie Brown. Uh, for all of their behind the scenes work and prep work uh, to Joyce and Jeannie and Sue and uh, Monica and Marilyn and Jill and J uh, Sarah and Kristen for all of the food that was made last night. I think I caught everybody in there. Um, of course, to thank Jen for our great um, slideshow that we had of pictures from the last two years and uh, to thank Ross and Robert for their great music uh, as well. Um, many of you said, what's that, I'm sorry? And all of the servers, you're right, thank you, Monica. Yes, we had Emma and Chris, and is there anybody else? And Linda, I'm sorry, Linda, yes, yep. See, this is why I don't name people by name because I'm gonna forget somebody. But um, it was really a great, great night. Um, there are leftovers, that's good news, right? So there are leftovers that are gonna be available today down in the Welcome Center. Um, we have some to-go boxes that have spaghetti and meatballs, some have just spaghetti, some have just spaghetti sauce, there's garlic bread, there's salad. So if you don't get enough at our almost lunch reception, then you can take lunch home with you, you see, it'll be great. There is a donation box if you'd like to donate towards those uh, things, uh, towards taking some of that home with you today. Um, here's the really amazing thing. We raised almost $600 last night. Now, before you get too excited, we had no intention on raising any money. It wasn't for the purpose of raising, but God just put on the heart of the people who were serving and helping that um, they wanted to help cover some of the costs. And so because of that, and because of the many donations that were made, we, we raised almost $600 last night. So God is good. Absolutely. Very, very cool. Yes. Yes. Okay, <laughs> yes. So there are, there are five three-gallon jugs of sauce that are left over. Um, so if you would have a use for an insane amount of spaghetti sauce, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> um, but no, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, otherwise Ralph's eating spaghetti for the next five years. Um, it was really a great uh, event. Thank you to everyone who came. Um, and as I said last night, isn't it amazing what the Lord has been doing in this place, even in the midst of such a difficult time? And so what a great opportunity it was to give thanks last night. One last thing, we have another great event coming up. Our movie night happens on March 18th, March 18th, beginning at 7 p.m. Uh, the movie is Son of God, and it's a really great uh, dramatic film about the life of Jesus um, that was put out in 2014. We'll be watching that up here on a big screen. We're going to have movie theater popcorn and candy and sodas. Uh, you know, where else can you go and have a night out at the movies for a free will donation? So um, that would be a great thing. Uh, the really cool part about that event um, that 
dawned on me last night is, is we didn't really intend it for a fundraiser, but any money that is donated will, will be profit, will be helpful to our budget. And so we, we do have some big things coming up this year that we're trying to save up for and get ready for. So uh, come, enjoy a great night of uh, a movie and some snacks, um, maybe a date night, you know, who knows? Um, we'll make sure you sit three feet apart, you know, whatever, but <laughs> it'll be a great, great time. So be sure to join us March 18th for our movie night. There are, oh, Jeannie has one more thing. Oh, right, yes, in your bulletin this morning, you should have an insert for our Lenten dinner and discussion that starts in just two weeks' time. So um, March 2nd is the first one. Uh, it is going to begin at 6 p.m. We will have uh, soup, salad, bread, desserts. Uh, every Wednesday evening during Lent at 6 p.m., we will gather down in the uh, Beacon Room this year, okay? And we'll be gathering for a small meal and then um, uh, a discussion afterwards. And our theme this year is love. We're going to be looking at uh, love as it happens in Scripture. Um, so I think it'll be a great uh, time together. That happens every Wednesday evening beginning March 2nd um, in the Beacon Room at 6 p.m., okay? In your bulletins, you also have uh, an update to the prayer list. There are some updates that have been made there. Um, and uh, I know some of you have some questions. If you want uh, more personal updates, feel free to see myself or Jeannie um, after uh, uh, worship, and we can give you those updates. Um, but now, Joyce, will you come and lead us in prayer? Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we do praise you with all that we have. We are truly thankful that we can come to you with our praises and our concerns. We know that you are the one in charge, not us, and that all things will be revealed in, our, in your time. We thank you for all that you have given us, our families, our friends, and most importantly, Jesus. We ask that you be with those in our lives who are ill, are facing surgery, or recovering from surgery. For those of us still feeling the effects of COVID-19, whether it be physical or financial, please be with those who have lost loved ones. Help them to find peace. We also ask that you be with our government. Help them to make decisions with you in mind and not with their own agendas. Lord, we need you every hour of every day. We are so thankful that we can come to you with all of our concerns. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. just a whisper 
Well, brothers and sisters, as we come now to hear the word of God, would you stand giving God's word its fullest authority in your hearts, in your minds, and in your lives today? This morning we read from Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. Jesus continued preaching and he said, You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. And you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. 
And it has been said, <coughs> excuse me, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And again, you have heard that it was said that people long ago do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to, the, to, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word to us. You may be seated. I'm sure Jesus preached that passage a lot better than I just read it. When it comes to the matter of sin. We so often hear well-meaning Christian folks say something like this about their sin. They say, well, at least it wasn't murder. Perhaps you've heard about or even read about the supposed seven deadly sins. One of the early church fathers who was known as Pope Gregory VI, he was the first to write down these seven sins and was also the first to categorize them as supposedly being deadly. Nearly 700 years after Gregory VI, a man by the name of Thomas Aquinas a leader in the Catholic Church, defined these sins even further. He listed them this way, that they are things like vainglory. Today we would use the word pride or, or covetousness. Today we would call that greed. Lust, envy, gluttony, or being given to excess or inordinate amounts of something, usually food or drink. Wrath or anger. And Sarah's favorite, right? Not because she's lazy, but because she likes sloths. Sloth, right? Or laziness. I think from this point forward, instead of reminding my son that he's sometimes lazy, I'll remind him he's sloth. How about that, right? How often do you get to say that? Even worse than this list, by the way, the church has throughout its theological history taught that there are an even yet higher level of sins, sin more egregious than these seven deadly sins. These kinds of sin are referred to as mortal or cardinal sins. And they include things like suicide, rape, abortion, divorce. Now, though the Roman Catholic Church has not and apparently will not ever disclose a complete list of these cardinal sins, mortal sins. The Roman Catholic theology says that these sins are merely referred to as the gravest of all sins, representing a deliberate turning away from God and eradication of the love of God and the charity of God in one's heart. Now, if that list or those two lists weren't bad enough when we're talking about sin, historically speaking, especially the Catholic Church has maintained an even worse list of sins. These are sins that some theologians and some doctrines have suggested are beyond God's forgiveness. If these sins are committed, one must be excommunicated from the church. Among these horrific sins are things like apostasy, 
desecration of the elements of the Holy Eucharist. Wow. It's really no wonder, right, that folks don't want to talk about sin. It's really no wonder that folks aren't just walking through their door saying, hey, pastor, let's talk about my sin today. Because sin is confusing, it's complex. From this historic theologic perspective, it seems that one almost has to carry around their pocket guide to the index of sin in order to accurately calculate the impact a particular sin has on one's eternal destiny with a theological perspective on sin that functions this way, it's no wonder that we have people in the world walking around in this world methodically scheming, determining just how much sin can I sin and still get away with it. It's no wonder with theologies like this in our world today. That other kinds of man-made theologies pop up, like, for example, purgatory, and the idea of being able to pray people back from hell. But here's the problem with all of this talk we've had thus far on sin this morning. It's not at all how Jesus approaches sin. Jesus' viewpoint on sin is so radically different from a hierarchy of sin, each one being or, or, more or less or bearing more or less sin weight than the one before it. Jesus simply called sin, sin. He wasn't concerned with the severity of that sin. He wasn't concerned with, you know, the frequency. He was rather concerned with the condition of the heart. And of course, Preventing, if at all possible, future sinfulness. That doesn't mean that Jesus' view of sin is somehow easier or, or less. In fact, Jesus' view of sin is quite the opposite. Jesus does not take sin lightly, no matter what kind of sin we are talking about. Pastor Charles F. Stanley He's pastor emeritus of First Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. He writes this. He says, Jesus made it clear that God is not after outward compliance, but inward change. He doesn't want religious fanatics, but transformed men and women. He wants people who love to do his will. That, brothers and sisters, is where we're going to spend our time this morning. That is what Jesus' message is for us today. Jesus isn't concerned with gathering together a church of people who look like they have it all together. Instead, Jesus is more concerned with gathering around himself people who actually recognize their sinfulness, understand that sin is sin is sin is sin, and actually have a heart for changing that sinful behavior. In other words, I would say it this way. Jesus intends to build a perfect church filled with holy, imperfect people who are perfectly ready to learn perfection from God, who alone is perfect. Did you get that? He's ready to build a perfect church with perfectly imperfect people who are perfectly ready to learn perfection from God. Jesus presents, I think, five pretty simple and short case studies this morning on sin. He talks to us about murder. He talks to us about adultery, divorce, oaths, and covetousness. The Expositor's Bible Commentary notes that for today, our text, Matthew 5, is often referred to as the antithesis passages. It's antithesis because each new passage begins with Jesus saying, you've heard it said, now here's the antithesis, but I tell you, right? You've heard it said, but I tell you. 
People have suggested that Jesus is criticizing the Old Testament here, or that he's even trying to replace the Old Testament with his own viewpoint. Jesus is not critical of the Old Testament. He certainly isn't trying to replace his father's words with his own. Instead, Jesus is critical of the understanding that the church has taken on the matter of sin. Expositor's Bible commentary says the contrast between what the people had heard and what Jesus taught is not based on distinctions like outer legalism versus inner commitment or false interpretation versus true. Rather, in every case, Jesus contrasts the people's misunderstanding of the law with the true direction which the law points. So Jesus' intent in this part of the Sermon on the Mount is simple. He just wants to correct flawed thinking. The Old Testament has been passed down verbally. One child of Israel sharing the Old Testament with the next child of Israel, while the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was certainly at work in this oral society, the reality of human error in the interpretation is absolutely there. It existed then just as it does today. The word of God isn't wrong. It's man's understanding of God and his word that has gone awry from time to time. So Jesus in this moment sets out to repair the damage and correct the flawed thinking. And so he begins each new thought with a simple corrective statement. You say that my father's word says this. I tell you, this is what my father's word actually says says. So here's the five key teaching points from Jesus. Yesterday, as I was finishing up, Jesus, or Jesus, almost, Sarah said, (laughs) Sarah said to me, you're going to kill them five points. Here we go. Ready? Murder is sin, but so is anger. Murder is sin, but so is anger. Jesus begins his teaching with one sin that everyone was all too happy to talk about because after all, like we said before, as long as nobody's been killed, then at least there wasn't murder. Have you ever heard anybody trying to offer comfort of, uh, a comforting word by saying, well, listen, it looks bad, but nobody died, so it can't be all that bad. Say that the next time somebody gets food poisoning, right? (laughs) This statement is true enough, but there is a horrifically short-sighted problem inherent in this thinking. Does someone really need to die in order for sin to be a problem? Jesus doesn't seem to think so. He says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in dangers of the fires of hell. Jesus' concern wasn't with murder, at least not only. He stands opposed to taking life in whatever way a human mind might conceive of taking another person's life. But Jesus stops here to suggest that in the same way that we should be opposed to murder, we should be opposed to, or we should be trying to avoid murder at all costs. And where does murder start? In the same way that we are trying to avoid murder at all costs, we need to have the same concern when it comes to our hearts dealing with anger. Because, I mean, yes, murder is sin, but so is anger. And guess where that murder started out as anger in someone's heart? Jesus doesn't stop just by simply calling out anger here either, by the way. Remember that term we heard, raka? Jesus said, if you call a brother or sister raka, that's an Aramaic term that means empty-headed. Empty headed. In other words, the law of Israel, the entire law of the Roman Empire says that if you insult somebody by saying, you empty head, you will be found accountable in court. Jesus says, the problem isn't just questioning someone's mental fortitude, because the problem is so much deeper. It's anger. It's anger. 
So if you call someone raka, you empty-headed person, you're going to be held accountable. But just so you know, if you have anger in your heart against someone, you're going to be held accountable too. The second point Jesus makes, adultery is sin, but so is lust. But so is lust. In much the same way that Jesus teaches on murder, he teaches on adultery. He uses the same teaching style, the same language. He says, you have heard it said that adultery is sin. That's true. But let me tell you where adultery started, Jesus said. It started as lust, and lust over time grows into passion, and that passion turns into adultery. Therefore, adultery is sin. Yeah, but so is the lust that bred that adultery. The apostle John wrote in his first letter, he said, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life comes not from the father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. You notice the problem that John describes here? He says, it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of the life. You see, the lustful eye gives way to the lustful flesh that demonstrates one's pride in this life, not the next. The third point Jesus makes. He says, divorce is just another form of adultery. Divorce is just another form of adultery. Now, I'm going to step away from my notes for a moment because divorce is a hard topic in the church. Because there are brothers and sisters seated here today who have experienced divorce for a host of reasons. Let me share with you this morning Jesus' understanding of divorce. It's hard to hear, it really is. But what Jesus is saying is we've got to rethink the way we look at divorce. The Expositor's Bible Commentary makes this powerful and pointed statement about the adultery of divorce. It says the Old Testament not only points toward insisting that lust is the moral equivalent of adultery, but that divorce is as well. This arises out of the fact that the divorced woman will in most circumstances remarry, especially in first century Palestine, where this would probably be her only means of support. The new marriage, whether from the perspective of the divorcee or the one marrying her, is adulterous. You see, the problem here is that our world doesn't like Jesus' words. Jesus seems to say divorce is it is not permitted. But in our world, we hear things like divorce is not only permitted, it's accepted, it's understood, and perhaps it's even profitable. The conclusion being that if your marriage has failed, divorce is the only answer. I don't have time this morning to go into the deeper problem that exists within this one statement. So I'm gonna to have to just summarize for you today. Divorce is sinful because by its very nature, it has broken the covenant of marriage with God. Because at the end of the day, what marriage is, is just that. It is a covenantal relationship, a covenantal agreement between God and his people. We don't simply enter into a relationship with our spouse in marriage. We enter into a deeper relationship, the three of us together with God, a covenantal relationship with God. In the marriage covenant, God says... As the two of you learn to love one another deeper every single day, I, the Lord your God, have the blessing, the joy, the pleasure, and the honor of blessing you within that covenant. Blessing comes as we learn to love one another, to live with one another, and to cherish one another from this day and forevermore. But divorce, however, comes 
when we are apparently no longer able to love, honor, and cherish. And, and now I need you to know, this may be for the best of reasons. It may be because of sexual immorality, as Jesus suggests. It could be because of an infidelity of one kind or another. But that doesn't change things. Just because the situation changed, the sinfulness of divorce isn't somehow taken out of the equation. So what does that mean? Does Jesus permit divorce? Does Jesus accept divorce? It sure sounds like he accepts it and permits it. But listen closely to what Jesus said. He says, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. In Dr. Eugene Peterson's writing called The Message, which is a paraphrase of the Bible, he, he wrote it this way. He says, Remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally, giving her divorce papers and legal rights. Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous just because you're legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress unless she's already made herself one. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use a legal cover to mask a moral failure. Here's how I might summarize Jesus' point today. He says, brothers and sisters, divorce is sin, period. It breaks a covenant with God. But just like every other sin, you hear that? Just like every other sin, it can be confessed. It can be repented and it can be forgiven. But just because this sin can be forgiven, Jesus says, don't go there unless you absolutely 100% have to. Don't use divorce as your get out of jail free pass. Because divorce is still sin. We must always, brothers and sisters, fight for the sanctity of marriage. Where infidelity has already taken its toll on the marriage, yes, divorce may proceed. But it's still sin, and it still needs to be confessed. Because at the end of the day, sin is sin is sin. The fourth thing Jesus brings to our attention. He says, swearing an oath is unnecessary. So just stick with yes and no. This teaching is probably Jesus' most culturally specific teaching in this entire passage because in Jesus' day, men would make legally binding agreements on property, on possessions, cattle, even the marriages of their daughters by swearing an oath. By the way, this is where we get the idea of someone being a man of his word, right? You ever hear children playing together and they say, hey, you swear it. And the next child says, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. <laughs> that is an oath. That is swearing an oath. It's something that can be said to increase the credibility of my words while also increasing my indebtedness should I be wrong. Pastor John MacArthur says that this should not be taken as a universal condemnation of all oaths. God himself confirmed a promise with an oath. Christ spoke under an oath and the law prescribed oaths in certain circumstances. But here, what Christ is foreboding here is the flippant, profane, and careless use of oaths in everyday speech. In that culture, such oaths were often employed for deceptive purposes to make the person being victimized believe the truth was being told. The Jews would swear by heaven, earth, Jerusalem, or their own heads, not by God, hoping to avoid divine judgment for their lie. That was Jesus' world, very culturally specific. But we find much of the same thing happening in our world today. There are oaths around us all the time. You ever hear things like this? Somebody tells you something, they go, trust me. 
It's true. Or I swear on my mother's grave. Or I swear to God. Well, it has to be true now, right? Or what about this one? I love this one. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Why do people use these kind of oaths? Because in our human frailty, we are prone to lie. If that wasn't so, we would never have a reason to begin a sentence with, now, now, tell me the truth. Why do we have to go to somebody and say, now, now, Jill, tell me the truth. If, if, I, if I never thought she was going to lie to me, I'd never have to say, now, Jill, tell me the truth. Right? Why did Art Linkletter have such incredible success with his show, Kids Say the Darndest Things? Because these children were at such a place of honesty and naivety before they had learned the art of deception. So he would ask them some basic, simple question, and they would give him the most honest answer in the world, and it was the darndest thing. Jesus knows our propensity to cover things up, to forego the details from time to time. And he urges us to fight for a reputation that so precedes us that we need to never say anything more than yes or no. And Jesus' last point for today. He says, give freely to the one who asks of you and do not turn away from those who wish to borrow from you. Do you remember that list of deadly sins that we started with this morning? It had pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, anger, and laziness. What's at the very heart of each and every one of those sins? Think about it. My pride. My greed. My lust. My envy, my desire for too much, my anger, my laziness. Jesus concludes this passage on the misunderstood sins by reminding us all that the most misunderstood concept in all of Scripture is the simple fact that what I have does not belong to me. Instead, everything that I have has been given to me in trust by God. So I must be faithful to those gifts as God would be faithful. And God is not now, nor will he ever be a hoarder. Let that sink in. Who has, who has the greatest of all storehouses ever? God. But in Micah's prophecy, he says, test me in this. Test my faithfulness and see if I won't fling wide open the doors of the storehouses so that you have more than you could ever possibly need. God is not now, nor will he ever be a hoarder, and neither should we be with his resources and his gifts that he has given to us. So here's how I think Jesus wants us to apply all of this teaching. I know it's a lot. You're probably still wrestling with that divorce thing, aren't you? Here's how Jesus wants us to apply this. He says a disciple's primary obligation is to serve those around them. Now here's the kicker. Here's where he really sticks the dagger in. To serve those around them, both those who seem to deserve it and even those who don't. Because the people in this world who are struggling with sin the most are the people who look like they don't deserve your goodness, your grace, your mercy. So whether it's an oath, divorce, murder, adultery, Sin 
is sin. And it all needs to be repented because it can all be forgiven. That's the good news today, brothers and sisters. That's the good news. Sin is sin, and it can be forgiven. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this powerful word for us today. Father, thank you that there is not some hierarchy of sin, but rather, Father, that sin is sin. And that you, Father, your willingness to hear our sin, to let us come and speak the words of our sin, that your ears might hear them, Father, your willingness to forgive our sin, your willingness to restore us to right relationship with you in spite of our sin. Father, will you help to correct our understanding of sin? Will you help us to hear when Jesus says, you have heard it said, But I tell you, because, Father, there is mercy and there is grace upon grace upon grace when we hear Jesus say, but I say to you. Yes, Father, Jesus calls us to a life that is not easier. It is not sometimes pleasant. It is often difficult and complex and filled with lots of difficult conversations and moments when we have to accept our responsibility and know that we've been in the wrong. But Father, with Jesus' words come mercy and grace and the opportunity for forgiveness. Father, help us to see our sin, to claim it, And most importantly, Father, to bring it to the feet of your throne that it too may be cleansed, that we may be purged and sent away once again right with you. Father, we thank you for this difficult yet powerful and hopeful word. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
brothers and sisters, doesn't the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God just make your heart want to sing? And when we can finally correct our understanding on sin and recognize that sin is sin and it all needs to be repented, that there's no little bitty sins that God doesn't care about and there's no huge sins that God can't get over, but that sin is sin and it needs to be repented, then the grace and mercy of Jesus comes on us. Then our hearts are freed to sing. So go with the love of the God who wants to hear from you. He wants to hear about all the stuff and the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ who wants to forgive you and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to lead you to the foot of the cross and to lead you every single day. Amen? Blessings flow.